there, please. Anyone online or in person? Great, thank you. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this new life, this dear Father. For I thank you for this opportunity for the gathering for your name. For the name for your adventure of war, so for Father, I send for Holy. If you want, and especially free for hands, I send for hands. Lord, you talk with us through Abraham's. Lord, give your consideration, give your patience, strength will be happening for our lives, to our lives, and it will be understanding, give your understanding of our lives, from Father. Lord, I surrender your hands, and I ask you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, um, so I think we have a new, a few students who were not here last week. Uh, in person. I'm not sure if there are some online as well. Anyone who is new online or was not here last week? Okay. Welcome, Cyril. Um, okay, maybe we can just do a quick uh, introduction, just your name, where you're from, and uh, what you're doing currently, whether you're a full-time student or doing something else. Uh, we can start with you, uh, Cyril, and if anyone else online uh, has not yet introduced themselves, you can go ahead. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Ma'am, I'm from Vijayawada, Andhra Pradesh. I had it first time as offline, influence student. And then I took second semester for online for to complete my inter, inter second year. Okay. Thank you. Welcome Thank to you. class. Thank you. Anyone else who's joining us online who is uh, here for the first week, first time in class? Okay, uh, so maybe the in-person students who didn't get to introduce themselves last week, if you all can just say your name, where you're from, and uh, what you I think most of you will be full-time students, but you can say whether you're a full-time student or uh, you're doing something else uh, on the side as well. Uh, we'll just pass the mic on. My name is Koval Sitan Suekka. Uh, I'm from Jharkhand. I'm full time student. Thank you. Can you tell me your name again? Komal Sitan Suekka. Kopal. Komal Komal. Okay. Welcome. My name is my name is Sulpas Patel. I'm from Rajasthan. Welcome. And full time student. My name is Asapu. Asapu. Asabu, okay. from Andhra Pradesh. Okay. I am a full full time student. Thank you. Welcome. I am a Prem Katija. I am from Madhya Pradesh, full time student. Okay. My name is Sugat Gaikwad. I am from Maharashtra, full time minister. Okay, welcome. Everyone else is here, right? Yeah, and all those who introduced, were you there last week? Did you introduce? You were there for the second class, I think. OK, do you want to just introduce yourself as well? My name is Joseph Williams. 
Joseph. Yeah, I'm from Chhattisgarh. Chhattisgarh. Welcome. Okay, uh, so thank you to all of you who are here for the first time, all of you are uh, joining us for the second week. Um, so we'll just do a quick review of what we covered last week and then um, go into the content for today. Um, I think we all need to have your um, projector on. Okay, so uh, last week we looked at, uh, we just started with God's Word, The Miracle Seed, which is the first book we are covering in uh, interpreting scripture. So in this book, the main uh, goal is for us to recognize how important the Word of God is for us as believers and uh, how we can um, receive the word for ourselves and see it bear fruit in our lives. So before we can talk about how do we interpret scripture for others or even for ourselves, we first want to look at why is scripture important in the first place? What uh, What is it in scripture that we, uh, why is it that we want to study scripture? Why is it important to interpret scripture correctly? Uh, all of those things. So. Uh, God's Word, the Miracle Seed, an introduction. Um, so uh, we want to talk about, uh, th these are a few things that we covered last week, uh, that God works miracles through His Word. So it's not only the supernatural manifestations that we see, but it's even the simple uh, act of reading God's Word daily, of meditating on His Word, of uh, doing those things that seem... Um, that seem just normal, everyday things that we do, right? We just read the word. We don't, we may not see anything uh, really big happen in our everyday reading of scripture, but it's through that everyday practice that God begins to work in our lives and begins to work out uh, supernatural things that may not be visible uh, to just our eyes. We may not be able to see it with our eyes, but God works uh, through that practice of studying scripture. Um, there is power and life in his word, and we see that right from Genesis, where uh, God speaks his word and the world comes into being. So from nothing, something is created, right? And that's only because of God's word being spoken. Uh, so there is power, there is life in the word of God, uh, and it's through that word that life came into being. Um, and it is through meditating on God's word that we begin to experience that power in our own lives. So uh, we will be looking at how do we meditate on God's word through this book. Um, so it's as we approach the word of God with faith that we get to see it bear fruit in our lives. Uh, so when we trust uh, that God is someone who will fulfill his word, that we, when we believe that there is power in the word of God, then it is only then that we start to see that word work in our lives. Uh, so faith is key to seeing it make a difference in our lives. Uh, and then we looked at Jesus' example. Uh, so Jesus being the word of God, the eternal word of God who became flesh, Right? We see that in John. Um, how did he deal with the written scriptures? Uh, so we see that he studied the scriptures. He used the scriptures when he was tempted. He uh, resisted temptation with the, using the scriptures. And then the way he lived his life was in fulfillment of the scriptures. So we see in by Jesus' example that he 
honored the word of God. He treated it as something uh, that is uh, of utmost importance, right? If he himself was the word of God, but he was asking questions, he was studying the word of God, uh, that means that there is great importance in the scriptures that we need to also learn from Jesus' example. Um, we also see that it is through the word of God that people are saved. So uh, the gospel is the word of God, and it is through the preaching of the gospel that people come to know Christ. So uh, there is power in that word to bring people, to transform people's lives, to bring salvation to people. And uh, so that is an example also. All of these things are from scripture itself. What does scripture say about itself, about its importance? Uh, and so we look, we see in 1 Corinthians 1, 21, that it is through the preaching of, the God, of God's word that people are saved. Um, and then in 2 Timothy 3.16, uh, we see all scripture was inspired by God. So even though it was written by humans, uh, the inspiration, uh, the actual content of what is written in scriptures comes from the Holy Spirit. And so there is divine power infused in the words of scripture. And that's what uh, is has the power to impact our lives because it carries divine power and divine truth. OK, so uh, the scriptures allow us to see who God is. Uh, the scriptures give us a standard for the way we live our lives. So it sets a standard that is above the standards of the world. And we do not compromise our standards to match what is happening around us. We will always live by the standard of scripture, even if it's contrary to what we see happening around us. Uh, so uh, we will not in any way lower our standards to accommodate things around us. Um, the third one is scriptures are our authority. That is, we submit to scripture. Uh, we live uh, in obedience to scripture. And the last is that we let scripture abide in us, and we abide in the scriptures. So letting the scriptures inform how we live our lives every day. Um, yeah, we uh, we talked about this earlier that uh, God works through the, uh, this everyday task of being in His scripture. It doesn't have to be something big or supernatural, but even in that simple task of studying God's word. God works powerfully in our lives. Um, and then this uh, section on Psalm 138.2 is where God uh, says that he, uh, his word is above his name. Uh, that means his reputation is based on his word. And so if he is a God who fulfills his word, then his reputation can be trusted. But if he's God who does not fulfill, whose word cannot be trusted, uh, then uh, that in itself uh, makes him lose his reputation as one who we can go to, one who we can count on, one who we can trust in. Um, yeah, so today we'll begin uh, with God's word, its purity and power. Um, so uh, this is uh, just what we were looking at. God's reputation and God's name are tied together. Uh, now we're going to look at God's character. What is it about God's character that, uh, that affirms to us that we can trust in the word of God, that we can trust in what he has said? So if someone can read Hebrews 6, 11 to 18 for us. Hebrew chapter 6 verse 11 and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end verse 12 that you do not become uh, sluggish but uh, imitate those who through faith and uh, patience inherit the promises verse 13 
for when god made a promise to abraham because he could swear by no one greater he swore by himself was 40 saying surely a blessing i will bless you and multiplying i will multiply you was 15 and so after he had patiently endured he obedient he obedient the promise was 16 for men indeed swear by the greater and an sorry and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute was 17 thus god determining to show more abundantly to the hires of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath was 18 that by two immutable things in which it it is impossible for god to lie we we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us thank you so uh, we see two things here uh, that verse 18 talks about it says uh, those two things that affirm god's word are his promise and his oath okay uh, so his promise is uh, the promise that he has given in the scriptures right his word itself is a promise because everything that is stated there is about us being in covenant with him and what uh, is the result of that covenant right the blessings that come out of being in covenant with the lord uh, and his oath is that which he has sworn upon himself uh, so let's just read this passage i have it up here on the uh, on the PowerPoint, Genesis 22, 15 to 18. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed, because you have obeyed me. And so we see here uh, God swearing by himself, right? And when Hebrews talks about this passage, it says, there's nobody greater than God. Usually when you take an oath, you take it on somebody who is greater than you uh, or you, your uh, oath is on something or somebody that's greater than you but because there's no one greater than God he swore by himself that uh, I'm the greatest uh, being that can ever uh, be put on a pedestal or put as uh, the object of trust and so I swear by myself that I will do this um, if someone can read Malachi 3 6. Malachi, Malachi 3 6. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Okay. So uh, Malachi 3, 6 says, uh, God is unchanging. That means his character does not change. And so once he says something, he will do it. He will not change his mind. And what he does as a person, who he is as a person, will not change over time. Uh, and that's why we can trust in what he says. The second thing is God's word or God's promise. Uh, if uh, we can read Titus 1, 2, please. Titus chapter 1, verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie, promised before time began. And Numbers 23, 19.
numbers 2319 god is not man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind as he said and will he not do it or as he spoken and will he not fulfill it thank you so uh, we see in these two passages that god cannot lie right uh, that is his character he is uh, someone whose word uh, is can be fully fully trusted there is no point of time in which he is going to say something that is contrary to what he is going to do uh, or that is contrary to his character so whatever he says is in line with who he is and uh, whatever he does will be in line with what he has said he will never do something contrary to what he has said and uh, this is why we can trust in his word that he is a god who does not change and he is a god who will not lie right because we know he is a god who will never lie when he has said something we can trust in that word and we can believe that it will take place um we'll uh, look at what is the meaning of purity when it uh, when it talks about god's word being pure uh, we see here in psalm 126 the words of the lord are pure words like silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times right uh, so in psalm 126 the word of the lord is called pure uh, a word that is tested a word that has gone through the furnace and uh, has come out as something that is completely free of any kind of uh, any kind of falsehood anything that shouldn't belong to it is removed uh, so we look at these uh, passages psalm 119 160 someone can read that 1 kings 856 and let's just look at the uh, sister i'll read psalms 1 uh, 119 160 the uh, yeah. entirety of your word is truth and every one of your righteous righteous judgment endures forever yeah the entirety of your word is truth thank you uh, first kings 856 and then 1 peter 123 we'll just read that last passage so 1 kings 856 One Kings eight fifty six, blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel, according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised through his servant Moses. Thank you. So uh, here we see not one of God's promises has failed. right and uh, in first kings 8 it's talking about the promises that were made to moses so after after all those promises have been fulfilled the uh, the writer is saying not one of those promises failed so that means god's word had been tested it proved to be true because we see the fulfillment in the lives of the hebrew people so uh, whatever was promised was fulfilled and after that they're saying we see that god is a god who fulfills his promises uh, and then 1 peter 123 having been born again not of corruptible seed but incorruptible through the word of god which lives and abides forever So uh 1 Peter 1:23 talks about how the word is an eternal word it's not a word that is just for a season or for a short period of time uh so that is what it means for uh, words to be pure that means the words are true the words are tested and dependable and the word is enduring that it will last no matter when it was spoken whether it was 50 years or thousands of years ago uh we can believe that it will be fulfilled because it is a word that transcends time uh so it is in this assurance if we have such an assurance of 
God's word being pure, uh, of God's word being something that can be trusted because of who God is, because of who the person is who's speaking those words, uh, then we have a strong confidence. So Hebrews 6.18 talks about this. We have strong consolation. Uh, what does that mean? The Amplified Bible says it's a mighty indwelling strength and strong encouragement. That means there is a confidence within us that uh, whatever has been said will be accomplished, that no matter what our circumstances are, no matter uh, what the situation is, no matter what the challenges are that arise, we can confidently walk in those situations believing in these words because we know the character of God and we know uh, that these words are words that have been tested. Like we can look at uh, scriptural history and see how God has fulfilled his word in the past. And that's where our confidence comes from. Um, God's word is also a carrier of God's power. So Hebrews 11.3, uh, here we see that the word of God uh, was the invisible spiritual material that brought into existence the visible natural world. Uh, so if someone can read Hebrews 11.3 and someone else Hebrews 1.3. Hebrews 1.3. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that what we see was not made out of things which are visible. Thank you. And uh, someone read Hebrews 1 3. Hebrews 1 3, the word of God sustains all creation. Okay. Uh, I think we'll have to go back to the passage in scripture, Hebrews 1 3. Um, I'll just read that. The sun radiates God's own glory expresses the very nature of God, and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor, the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. Uh, so we see here um, in Hebrews that uh, that first passage talks about creation, right? Creation came into being because of God's word. Uh, there was nothing that existed. There was chaos, there was darkness, uh, and there was no life on earth. But it was the word of God that brought order, that brought creativity, that brought life into existence. And so um, we say that what was spiritual, that is the word of God, the divine word, brought about something physical or something natural that is the world and all creation was something that is physical and so if we take that principle and look at it in our own lives then we can we can believe that god by his word which carries his divine power can bring about changes in our natural everyday lives right so he can bring about changes in our finances he can bring about changes in our physical or mental or emotional health. Uh, he can bring about changes in our relationships. Uh, he can bring about changes in our circumstances, whether it's our jobs, um, whether it's our um, work that we are doing. Whatever the physical challenges that we experience in our everyday lives, we go back to the spiritual truth that is in God's word believing that that spiritual truth can impact our natural physical lives. Okay, looking at the example of creation. Hebrews 1.3 talks about not only the fact that the word of God brought all these things into existence, but the word of God continues to keep all things in order, continues to sustain creation. The reason why the world has not collapsed and completely disintegrated is because God continues to sustain it by his word. Uh, that, that that word carries that power of sustenance. And so that is the word that we go back to. When we're going back to scripture, we're going back to the same God who speaks creation into being, the same God who speaks a word that sustains all things, 
that God sustains us and that God is the one who is speaking to us through his word. Okay. Um, Romans 4.18. Uh, let me just read that for us. For Abraham, uh, this is the amplified version, so it has a little bit of an explanation. So it says, for Abraham, human reason for hope being gone, hoped in faith that he should become the father of many nations as he had been promised. So numberless shall your descendants be. Uh, so this is an example of somebody who trusted in God's word, even though by human reasoning, by uh, human understanding, it seemed completely impossible that God's word would be fulfilled in his life. Uh, but he continued to hope in faith. And that is the kind of faith that we are called to have, to stand on God's promises, even if everything else around us tells us logically this is not going to happen. Uh, we trust in God's power to work things out, even when we don't understand how it can happen. OK, so we look at um, this. Uh, the, I, I think this is the third chapter in your book. And uh, this is where most of the content from the book comes. Uh, we're looking specifically at the parable of the sower. So we will read that parable together. Uh, but uh, what is a parable? So Jesus used parables to tell people about God's kingdom, right? So he used examples from everyday life to communicate something that was beyond what we understand, something that was spiritual. Uh, he used things that common people could understand to communicate those things. So we look at this parable and we'll look at what are some things that we can learn about God's word from this parable and how we can apply it to our lives. Uh, so if somebody can read the parable for us, Mark 4, verses 1 to 10, and then verses 13 to 20. Again, Jesus began to teach besides the lake, and a very great crowd gathered about him so that he got into a ship in order to sit it on the sea, and the whole crowd was at the lakeside on the shore. And he taught them many things in parables, and in his teachings he said to them, Give attention to this. Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he was sowing, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on ground full of rocks where it had not much soil, and at once it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And when the sun came up, it was scorched, and because it had not taken root, it withered away. Other seed among thorn plants and the thistles grew and pressed together and utterly choked and suffocated it, and it yielded no grain. And other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing, and yielded up to 30 times as much, and 60 times as much, and even a hundred times as much as he had been sown. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him be hearing. And as soon as he was alone, those who were around him with the 12 apostles began to ask him about the parables. And he said to them, do you not discern and understand this parable? How then is it possible for you to discern and understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. The ones along the path are those who have the word sown. But when they hear, Satan coming, comes at once and takes away the message which is sown in them. And in the same way, the ones sown upon stony ground are those who, when they hear the word, at once receive and accept and welcome it with joy. And they have no real root in themselves, and so they endure for a little while. Then, when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, they immediately are offended, and they stumble and fall away. And the ones sown among the thorns are others who hear the word. Then, the cares and anxieties of the world, and distractions of this age, and the pleasure, and the delight, and false glamour, and 
deceitfulness of riches and the craving and passionate desire for other things creep in and choke and suffocate the word and it becomes fruitless and those sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and receive and accept and welcome it and bear fruit some 30 times as much as was sown some 60 times as much and some even a hundred times as much okay so um we read here this parable is basically about god's word right talking about uh, how god's word uh, and the power of god's word can be released into our lives and can bear fruit in our lives. So that last example, it can bear up to a hundredfold, right? Of that one seed that is planted can have such a huge impact. Uh, but on the other hand, the other examples show us how that word, although sown, will not bear fruit um, because of other things that come in and hinder its growth or hinder it from producing fruit. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we're going to look at in this passage. We look at how the word of God can either bear fruit in our lives or not bear fruit because of certain hindrances that come in, to our, uh, that come in from the outside. Um, so Jesus says here in Mark 4.13, um, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parables? Right. So uh, something that we can take away from this is that this parable shows us how we are to interpret other parables. So if we can understand this parable, then we'll also learn how to correctly interpret, how to correctly receive truth from the other parables. Um, and then the other thing is that this parable also uh, shows us how we can draw spiritual truth and spiritual insights from parables. When we look at a parable, what is the spiritual truth that's underlying that example that Jesus had used? So uh, these are the key thoughts we're going to look at in the parable of the sower. Uh, God's word is like a seed. Okay, so Mark 4.14, uh, that uh, just like a seed is sown in the ground, God's word is sown. And uh, as we looked at in the passage, uh, the ground represents a person's heart. Right, So uh, like a seed is sown in the ground, God's word is sown in the hearts of people. Um, and then we see Mark 4.15, our heart is the ground where the seed of God's word is to be sown. Uh, the third one is the seed must be protected and nurtured in order to produce fruit. So not only do we plant the seed, but we also protect what has been planted and we nurture what has been planted. Um, we must understand uh, the truth that is contained in God's word to keep Satan from stealing, uh, stealing the word from our hearts. So until we grasp the spiritual meaning that is within God's word, uh, we cannot protect that in our heart and we cannot protect it and make sure it bears fruit in our lives. Um, Five, regardless of what hardship or persecution we face, we need to hold on to the word of God. So we saw uh, the one example where the food, uh, the seed falls into stony ground. So it comes up, but as soon as there's persecution, as soon as there's hardship, uh, the plant gets choked out because there's no strong root holding it in place. Uh, and so we need to know how to hold on to God's word when we face persecution or when we face challenges. How do we make sure that we continue to trust in God's word and remain rooted in God's word? Uh, the sixth one, we guard our hearts against things that may come in from the outside. So uh, cares of this world, 
the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things and the pleasures of life. We will be going into detail in all of these points. So we look at what are those things that can come in and um, take over uh, God's word in our lives. So the cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, all of these things. How do those things come into our lives and take away what has been sown into our hearts? And then the last one is uh, when we understand, receive, and retain. So we're looking at uh, this passage uh, or this parable is, uh, is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So we read only from Mark, but in these points, these seven points that we're looking at, we've taken it from all three uh, Gospels, and we're looking at what are some principles that we can take from the three records we have of this parable. So from Matthew 13, 23, uh, it says, when you understand the word of God, then it will bear fruit. Mark 4 says, when you receive the word of God, and Luke says, when you retain the word of God. So what does it mean to understand, receive, and retain so that the word will bear fruit in our lives? So the first point we looked at is that the seed is the word of God. Uh, and uh, we see that right in uh, Mark, which we read when Mark is explaining it to the disciples. Uh, so he says in Mark 4.14, the farmer plants seeds by taking God's word to others. And Luke 8.11 says it very explicitly. It says, the seed is the word of God. Uh, and so um, looking at that, we know that uh, we use that example of a seed. So uh, 1 Peter 1.23, which we read before, it says, having been born again, not of corruptible, but incorruptible seed, the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So this is the kind of seed we're talking about, right? When you look at a natural seed, it's a seed that uh, could die at any point of time, even though it has the power to, um, to bear fruit, to grow into a large tree there are times when the seed itself will decompose and die. But the word of God is an incorruptible seed, a seed that is eternal. So once it is sown, we can be sure that it will not die if we take proper care of it, if we make sure that it is not taken away from our hearts, and if we make sure that we are nurturing it properly, it will bear fruit. So um, what can we uh, learn from this example of a seed, right? So when Jesus used parables, he used things that were very familiar to the people he was talking to. Now, we may not have the same level of familiarity with sowing and reaping as uh, the Israelites had because they were an ag the agriculture was such a big part of their uh, culture, but we understand the way seeds work, right? You put a seed in the ground, you water it, you give it sunlight, you give it the nutrients it requires, and you can, uh, and you'll see it bear fruit over time, even if it's a slow process. So um, we know that seeds have creative, life giving ability. That means seeds have the power to bring something into being. Right? You put in a seed, but what comes out? Yeah, a plant comes out, right? You don't just get more seeds. It doesn't just multiply into many more seeds. It grows into a plant that bears fruit, and then from that fruit, you get more seeds. Uh, but it, ha it brings about something that is bigger than itself. So it's a small thing that's planted, but what comes out is much, much larger and then multiplies into more and more seed. Um, so it has creative life-giving ability. Uh, I think we have time to look at these verses. Let's look at James 1.18. And it was of his own free will that he gave us birth as sons by his word of truth, so that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. 
a sample of what he created to be consecrated to himself. So here we see that uh, he gave birth to us through his word. Right? So when we're looking at that physical thing of planting a seed and the seed giving birth to something, here we see in scripture that the word of God gave birth to us as new creatures. So the gospel uh, brought about a new creation, just as the word of God brought about life in Genesis. Uh, in the same way, this gospel brought life to us as uh, believers. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Thank you. And Ephesians 2.20. Uh, 2.10, sorry. Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Thank you. So uh, we see in these passages, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 and Ephesians 2.10, that we are new creatures, new creation uh, in Christ. Right. So what James 1.18 said was the word of God uh, brought about our birth. And 2 Corinthians and Ephesians are talking about us being a new creation. So that's essentially what the Word of God uh, does. It brings about this life. It brings about uh, something that didn't exist before. Uh, and um, it's only when we sow and protect and nurture that Word that uh, it can bear fruit in our lives. So we'll take a break here and we'll come back and we'll look a little more into uh, what this means for us.